comic who wants to take your comedy to the next level, sometimes you need a little help. And that's where the Clean Comedy Challenge comes into play. This is Leslie Norris Townsend, and I'm the creator and producer of this challenging event. This year, we have three different locations, each with a cash prize. Two of the three are full-blown three-day events with seminars, critiques, and performances in a real comedy club. Past attendees include Johnny W., Charlene May, Andy Medango, Marty Simpson, and Mike Paramar, all who are now full-time comedians. So if you're ready to take advice from the pros and perform in a real comedy club, go to cleancomedychallenge.com. It's not where you start, it's where you finish. And don't forget to mention Rick Roberts School of Laughs, so I know where you came from. Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast, brought to you by schooloflaughs.com. Whether you're an aspiring comedian, a part-time pro, or a speaker who wants to become funnier, this is the podcast for you. We'll break down tools, tips, and techniques to help you get bigger, better, and more bookable. And now, here's the show. But they're good kids. They they grow up fast. You know that, too, if you're a parent. You know, my 12-year-old seems like he was 11 just last year. It's just uh, <laughs> mind-blowing. My Kentucky math is right on the money right there, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, I wasn't prepared for any of it. You know, sometimes they say f- scary stuff. Sometimes your kids will say something, you're like, where did they get that? Like one night, I'm tucking my boy into bed. I'm like, hey, buddy, hope you have sweet dreams. He looks up and he goes, I hope you're still breathing when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> I'm like, what do you know that I don't know? <laughs> Mama, switching my pills when I'm gone? What's going on? <laughs> I was awake the next morning. I didn't sleep a wink. <laughs> and for every scary thing they say, they say something funny, but you can't always laugh because it's not always the right kind of funny. Does that make any sense? Like one night we're brushing our teeth before we go to bed, and he's looking in the mirror at him for a while. Then I see him look over at me, then he looks back at himself, then back at me. I said, what's the matter, buddy? He's like, Papa. I just noticed me and you, we kind of look alike. I'm like, yeah, what do you think about that? He goes, what are you going to do? <laughs> well, you're probably not going to prom. <laughs> all right, I'm going to close your door all the way tonight and hope you're still breathing when I wake up in the morning. <laughs> Welcome to the School of Laughs podcast. Rick Roberts here. Thanks again to the Clean Comedy Challenge for sponsoring today's episode. And thanks to Patreon supporter Bruce Bradford Royal. If you'd like to learn how you can support the podcast through a small recurring monthly donation as little as $7. Actually, you can support us for as little as a dollar a month. But for $7, there's a lot of nice benefits for you. I'll tell you about at the end of the episode. You can learn all about this at schooloflaughs.com forward slash P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Thanks again, Bruce, and the over 30 people that support the podcast and help keep this thing moving. Well, today is going to be uh, hopefully interesting to you. If you have a CD that you're thinking about recording, something you want to knock out, a project uh, that you want to get on disc, this is all about doing that and about whether you do that independently, all by yourself, or do you pursue a record label to help you along with that. Today is uh, the day before the release of my 10th CD. CD comes out on March 16th. So if you're listening to this uh, on release date, it's tomorrow when it comes out. And this particular one, like I say, it's my 10th. The first nine I did all by myself. And you can do that. And I did that nine times where uh, I was responsible for getting the recording equipment set up. I was responsible for figuring out the venue. I was responsible for editing, all these different things. And uh, I think you should do a CD like that, if not a couple like that. There's nothing wrong with it. And if you have the right equipment and the skill set, you can knock that out and and do it. But this last one, the newest one, Thinking Real Loud, I went with a record label, 800 Pound Gorilla, uh, for a variety of reasons, which we'll get into here in the episode. So what I'm going to do is give you the uh, pros and cons of doing it by yourself and choosing a label. And then I'm going to walk you through the 10 steps, basically, it takes to get your CD done. Hopefully it doesn't sound overwhelming. They're, they're all important steps. You can't really skip any of them. But if you do them in this particular order and you do it thoughtfully, your CD project should be uh, something you look forward to as opposed to a heavy burden or a big chore. So 
let's take a look first at the uh, pros and cons of doing it yourself completely independent or going with a record label, whether it's a, a major record label, which is, is not a realistic goal for a lot of people, but an independent record label surely is. So let's say, let's start off with independent. So if you're going to record your own CD independently, all by yourself, uh, the pros, and there are several pros, are as such. Pro number one, you've got total control of your project. From start to finish, you're making every decision along the way. So you're going to do it the way you want to do it and the way you think it ought to be done. That's not a bad thing. That's a great thing. It is a lot of responsibility and you have to be task oriented. You have to be deadline driven and you have to be funny focused to get those things done. So total control, that's a great thing. You bear all the responsibility. So all the reward is yours as well. The other part of going independent that you got to think about is, you know, creating your deadlines. You have to be able to set your deadlines, think it out almost like a project manager. You know, if you're building a house, you know, you have to do certain things in a certain order. Same thing goes with your CD and you need deadlines because if you don't, you may not get those things done. I've learned there's a thing called Parkinson's law. Have you heard of Parkinson's law? It's not what it sounds like. Uh, Parkinson's law is all about, creating deadlines so you get things done. Basically, Parkinson's Law says, a task will expand to fill the time allotted for completion. So, to give you a good example, you set a deadline for next Friday, you have to get it done by next Friday, and you get it done by next Friday. An example of not meeting your deadlines uh, would be the American Picker Show. I watch that show a lot. It's my late night, wind down, don't have to use my brain kind of show. And on each episode of the American Pickers, they experience this Parkinson's law where, you know, the, the task will expand to the allotted time. And it shows up in negative ways. People have barns full of stuff that they're going to do something with one day. And they don't actually do anything until these pickers show up and force them to make a decision. Do you want to keep this or do you want to sell it? And almost every episode, they put... They pull a, a tarp off of a car in a barn that's been around since like 1930 or 40 or 50. And these, these cars are sitting there. They're projects. The owner or maybe the person's grandfather who passed away, whatever it might be, they were going to get to these things one day and fix them up and restore them, refurbish them, get them back on the road. They never do because the goal was one day. And if you checked your calendar, there's seven days. They all end with day, but none of them start with one. You got to have a day where you target completing your deadlines. So don't go the route of the American Pickers where there's no deadline. Set your deadlines. Make sure you knock those things out so the next domino can fall. So that's that's a positive if you're good at setting deadlines. Another pro if you're doing it all by yourself is you can record the shows as many times as you like until you finally get it down. The uh, tricky part with that is every show you do, there's going to be something you wish you did better. And you're going to think, you know what, that was pretty good, but I got a better one in me. And then you take your recording equipment to the next show and, hey, all that went good except for a couple of jokes that worked great last time. They didn't work great this time. So even though you have a lot of opportunities, sometimes it's like when you go to, you know, what's that restaurant, Chili's? Yeah, Chili's. You go to Chili's, they got like a nine or ten page menu. It's like everybody takes them 15 minutes to order something. If you go somewhere, there's like three things on the menu, boom. You go there, you get it, you're out. So even though it's nice to have that buffer and you don't, you know, turn in the final version of it until you get it recorded correctly, it may take you longer than you want because you keep waiting for the perfect show. Wait for a great show, but don't wait for the best show in the history of the world because it's, it's probably not going to happen. Uh, best case scenario, you set up, you have maybe a weekend at a club where you can record, put your equipment in place in, in one spot and record all four or five shows you do on the weekend and pick and choose from those shows if you like. So that's that's the pros, again, if you're able to do that correctly. If it's too much, too many choices, you'll never get the choice made. Another pro, of course, is you have 100% ownership of the project. Uh, you're not giving away royalties or, or percentages to anybody else. You create it, you sell it, and boom, all the money goes back in your pocket. That's not a bad thing at all. In fact, I did that nine different times, and I was happy with each of those. Here's where the pressure starts, though. 
when you're independent and you're doing it by yourself, you have 100% of the responsibility to promote, market, distribute, and collect on the sales of that CD. Again, I did that nine times and I was happy I did it all nine times. This time I wanted to try something different and I'll tell you about the pros and cons of going with a record label here in a second. But you do have a lot. It's a full-time job. And this is something that I don't think a lot of comedians uh, think about when they're recording. Hey, I'm going to get a CD. I'm going to sell it. It's going to be great. You got your CD, but you have to sell it. It becomes not only after your show, but you want to make sure you get it online. You want to make it get it on iTunes. You want to get it on Google Play. All these different places where people can get your CD downloaded. You got to get it to them. Now, there's ways you can do that that are easier than others. Uh, but you have to be the one to pull the trigger on that. So you're looking out for yourself and you have to get it done. All right, flip side really quick to what are the pros of having a record label involved? Well, just like some of the things we mentioned before, you have a little help along the way. The, um, you know, the record label is going to help you set some deadlines. Obviously, if you have a crew of people coming in to record a show, uh, they have to know where they're going to show up, where they're going to record, and you know how often they're going to do it. In my case here in Nashville, there was a couple different comedy clubs I could pick from Zanies, which I've done you know for 17 years, it seems like, since I've been here, maybe longer, maybe 20 years. And then there was a smaller club uh, called Third Coast, Third Coast Comedy Club, mainly an improvisational comedy club, but they have a great stage, an intimate setup that seats about 100 and the crowd is right there, right at your feet. Really nice setup. And I thought, you know, let's try it in there because the benefits of doing it there versus Zany's primarily was there was no bar in the room. So if you wanted to drink, you wanted to do that, you can go out to the bar. But the bar is not in the same showroom where the microphones are picking up the noise of the ice and the glasses and all that kind of stuff. Uh, that was the main thing. Plus, it was just easy to pick a date there. Uh, I pick a, picked a Wednesday night which was great until I realized most of the people I was inviting out to attend the show were churchgoers who had a church obligation on Wednesday. So one thing I would have done differently is picked a Tuesday or a Thursday where I knew I was going to be home during the week and uh, recorded on those nights. So I would have had a slightly bigger turnout than what I had. The people that showed up, if you're listening, I know a lot of podcast listeners uh, did show up. Thank you guys. Some traveled from quite a distance to be there. And I appreciate the support, and it was a good crowd. We had uh, just enough to, to record the CD, and they were great laughers, very in tune, and uh, zero heckling, which turned out to be a nice positive thing. <laughs> so what else if you go with your label? So you got to pick a specific date. In my case, I recorded one show. It was a one-take Charlie kind of deal where I didn't have three other shows to cut and paste and pick from. And luckily, I felt like the uh, recording was a good representation of what I do on stage and the reaction I get from it. We didn't sweeten a single track on the entire recording. We did edit a few things out just for pacing and, and edit a couple bits out where I stumbled a little bit, but it's exactly as it was that night on the CD. And I'm really happy for that. That could have worked against me. I mean, we could have had 10 people show up. They could have not laughed very much and I would have been out the expenses for that evening. But again, the record label and I were able to coordinate, get a date that worked for all of us. And because the label is based here in Nashville, it saved me quite a bit from uh, having to be you know, paying for their travel expenses if I recorded it somewhere else. And that, that would be the case. If I recorded it in any other city, I would have had to pay for them to get there, pay for their hotels, pay for them to get back, pay for their meals while they're there. It just worked out really good that they were based here in town. The other thing, of course, with the record label is they're going to kind of set up the mics probably better than I could. They're going to know how to work the room and get the angles, the right kind of microphones, uh, numerous microphones. I think we may have had six microphones capturing the audience in this uh, recording, and they had them set up. They were the right kind. They were out of the way, but they did their job, and they ran a mic off the board to get the microphone that I was using as well. And then in the mix down, they were able to you know, isolate the best tracks, uh, pan down the tracks that weren't catching the audience as much as they were maybe catching uh, other ambient sounds in the room. And I was really happy with the way they, they picked it and mixed it down. Which brings me to the next pro when you pick a record label is there's somebody else 
making the edits and those things for you. Now, to be clear, I picked a label who gave me 100%, 100% creative control. And what they did is they gave me the master. And then I went through and picked what would be tracks. You know, at the two and a half minute mark, that equals the first track. And then I, I named the track. And then I showed them where the next cut would be. So I kind of had a, a pretty involved editing experience with them. And that's only because, you know, that was up to me. If I could have just said, hey, you guys edit however you want, and they would have done it. I had the creative control. I wanted to make sure the pacing was there and it flowed right. And they certainly worked with me 100% on that. I'd make little notes, you know, cut at you know 12 minutes and 15 seconds and pick it back up at 13 minutes because I just did in the size of the crowd that really doesn't make the joke any better on recording, uh, which is something to think about <laughs> in the mix of all these things to think about. Sometimes when you're rec- you know, doing a live show, you would do things that don't necessarily translate to a recorded thing. So you have to be aware of how, how often you go off on a tangent just to build relationship with the audience, uh, those kinds of things, as opposed to deliver the laughs. And in my show, I pick a few different spots where I interact with the audience. And if they don't give me what I need, I go back to my material. Uh, in this case, I think every time I went to the audience, except for once, uh, the reaction and the direction they took it was funny, and I worked it back in. But listen to the CD as if you weren't there at the show. And if something doesn't make sense, then cut it out, because the person listening to your CD m- probably have the same experience. What else can I tell you? There's a little bit of pressure involved when you're working with a, a record label. They don't put the pressure on you, but I think I felt the pressure to do a really, really great job. Do it all in one night. Do it all in one take. I wanted to make sure that I, you know, was on the ball, fully alert, hit my five hour energy a couple hours before the show. And <laughs> and oddly enough, that works for me. It really clears my brain out, especially, uh, you know, the previous night. I'm going through all the possible scenarios, didn't sleep as much as I probably should have. And uh, that five hour, five hour energy picked me up, cleared me out and worked for me. Whatever you do to get ready for a show, uh, you want to do that on your recording date as well to make sure that you're in the mood, you're ready to go. And you've got it focused. The best part, I think, about recording with a record label is you've got a partner along the way with you. So, for example, if I was to record this by myself, I might have the recording in the can or on the tape or on the disc or whatever you want to call it. I might wait six months to start editing it down. Or I might start editing it and then something comes up and I can't finish it off. Then I get back to it and then I get distracted. With the record label, they have deadlines, you know, I worked with 800 pound gorilla and we had mutual you know, agreements on the deadlines and, and when to get things done. And I would get my part done, hand it to them. They would do it on their time, get it back to me. Then we move forward to the next step. And that was everything from the album art to the naming of the tracks, how long the tracks were, uh, what promotional steps we were going to take, the marketing. Uh, they helped me with my social. They created a little video to promote the CD. They did a pre-sale, they had an on-sale. All these things uh, were a great relief to me to have somebody else help out. I'm a full-time comedian. I'm a full-time dad. I teach comedy classes. I travel. Time is the one thing that I have the least amount of. And when you have a record label on your side, you're borrowing hours, and they're giving you hours. Uh, The trade-off, of course, is I give them the percent. I give them a certain percent of the airplay on digital And uh, that's the agreement I was happy with. Again, I did nine CDs where I had total 100% ownership, but I didn't always have the access to the network, to the relationships, and to the marketing, and all those things that a record label provides. So I thought, you know what? I've got zero to lose. Uh, I wanted to put out a CD, was having a hard time doing it on my own. Because I am so busy, went with the record label, and so far, 100% satisfaction i uh, really excited about the way it's going, really excited about the way it sounds. You're hearing clips throughout this uh, podcast episode from that CD, and uh, just really, really happy with the way it turned out. Nice and crisp and clean, and the whole process has been really, really nice. If I didn't have the record label on my side, I would have to do all the promoting, all the marketing, all the distribution, lots of work. Again, I get 100% of the reward for all that work, but I don't have 100% of the time that I used to have. So again, different things to think about along the way, whether you do it on your own or do it with a label. If it's your first CD, I see nothing wrong with trying it on your own. 
the good thing is if you do it on your own and you don't get the results you like, you don't have to release it. I thought, you know, with the record label, I'm at a part in my career now where I was pretty competent in delivering the show. They were able to capture it and then together we can promote it. They get rewarded for their work. I get rewarded for mine and the project gets done. So what are the steps? We talked a little bit about them here in this first part. I'm going to take a break, play another clip from the CD. And when I come back, we'll talk about the 10 steps you need to take in order to get your CD project complete. My parents' first time on a computer was this past Christmas. We got them on with a little camera so they can Skype, see their grandkids anytime they want. That's what they're supposed to use it for. <laughs> yeah, I get back home to Tennessee. My dad calls me up on the regular phone. He's like, Richard Dale, I'm about to fire off an email. Keep an eye out for it. <laughs> I'm like, I will. And just so you know, you don't have to call people right before you send them an email. <laughs> If you're going to text me later, how about a smoke signal? That'd be good. <laughs> Maybe two, it's windy. <laughs> so I go check my inbox. I can't believe my dad figured out how to set up email. But the email in there isn't coming directly from him. It's asking me if I would like to follow him on Twitter. <laughs> this isn't good for me, my dad, or Twitter, y'all. <laughs> y'all think Donald Trump's crazy on Twitter. Wait till you see what my dad's got. <laughs> So I thought, okay, he's only had the computer for a couple of days, probably just set up a Twitter feed. Let's, let's go check it out. Well, I log on there. In two days, how many, how many tweets do you think a normal person would put out in two days? How many would y'all put out in two days? Four. 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 Yeah, that's good. Couple a day. 116 <laughs> tweets. <laughs> All capital letters. <laughs> no punctuation. Just running on like the Unabomber's manifesto. <laughs> and zero followers. <laughs> I'm like, he's just tweeting in the breeze. <laughs> I'm like, I can't believe, where did my dad get 116 thoughts, you know? <laughs> Not to be rude, but my dad's an old, quiet tobacco farmer. He doesn't, he doesn't say 116 words a week unless he eats out twice and has to order off the menu. Like, <laughs> so I start thinking, maybe this is his way of communicating. This could be good, for, you know? Maybe he's like Mark Twain on the inside. I didn't know all these years. So I started reading down through the 116 to see what kind of thoughts were going on there. And I figured out after about 10, it wasn't 116 different thoughts. Just one big story broken into 116 pieces. <laughs> it gets even worse. Whole story was about birds because my dad thought Twitter was a bird watching, updating website. <laughs> That's my gene pool. I'm lucky I'm walking. I can't believe, if you want to follow my dad on Twitter, please do. He's only got two followers. It's me and the Audubon Society. <laughs> uh, you can find him. It's at Nuthatcher4012618853, <laughs> which is also his social security number. <laughs> if you want to log him out, the password is password. <laughs> All capitals. All right, hope you enjoyed a couple of laughs there. Uh, I love the way the CD sounds. As you can tell, probably from listening, it was a nice, intimate crowd and uh, very crisp and clean. In the comedy club setting, uh, if I'd done it at Zany's, I think there'd been a little bit more ambient noise, a little bit distraction. This was really you know, almost like a mini theater, the way the, the club is set up, and I was really proud of and happy with the way they captured it on recording. So, all right, what are the 10 steps it takes to get your CD done? This may vary a little bit for different people, but I'm going to give you the basic 10 steps in case you're thinking about getting your project recorded pretty soon. I think the first obvious step is, do you have the material? Are you concentrating every time you hit the stage, whether it's open mic, whether it's a showcase set, or maybe it's a booked gig, are you working on material to lay down to record? You don't always do that, to be honest, right? Sometimes you hit the stage like, let's just see where this goes tonight. If you're going to record a CD, you want to start six months out probably working that material, getting it organized, getting the flow of your hour, however long your CD is going to be. I recommend an hour. Uh, it may be shorter if you're newer, or you may team up with two comics and do a half-hour piece, however you want to get it done. But you want to start getting into a normal flow of your material so that when you go to record it that night, the material is second nature. It's in the back of your mind. You've memorized it so much you can forget it and pull it back at a moment's notice. That's where you want to be so you're not looking at your notes the entire show and telegraphing to the audience, I don't know what I'm doing. You know, on this CD, I did make a few notes, had them on the side of the stage, and I went through my entire set, looked over and picked up a couple of pieces that I wanted to add into the CD. 
but by no means was I checking it all the way through and trying to figure out the joke on stage. These jokes had been written, tightly performed, whittled down till I had it to the best possible version of the joke. So get your material together when you know you're hitting the material 100% all the time. You got that. That's when you want to find a date, time, place, location for your CD recording. Uh, and that, you know, you might want to start that process even before you think you've got your material down, but as you're getting close, because a lot of places are booked two or three months out. And that was the case for me uh, when I started to look at uh, venues around Nashville. The Third Coast Comedy Club is the one I decided to go with. And then by the time I contacted them, they were booked two or three months out. So I could have got the CD recorded a little bit early and released uh, before Christmas last year, but you know, I waited a little late to pick a spot. But I picked the night that they had on the calendar and finalized the uh, the thing for that. And, you know, as much as you're promoting your CD, you need to promote the show to get people there. So that's, uh, I guess, the third thing. You get your material, you get your show. Then three, you've got your production of the show. You need to get your Facebook ads going, which I did, promote it on your website, which I did, on your Twitter, which I did. And that is a small job in and of itself to promote a show. So hopefully it won't be the first time you've promoted a show when you're promoting your CD recording. You want to make sure that you have uh, those mechanisms in place. You know how Google ads work. If you're doing Google ads, you know how Facebook ads, all those, whatever platform you're going to promote it on. Uh, Facebook is the easiest to target, especially a local area, local zip code, and get people out. You want to email your email list. I've talked about the email list and how important that is on a lot of different episodes. But you want to make sure all your channels are uh, at full steam ahead to get the people in the audience. Even that night, uh, as I went over there a little early to set up sound equipment and that kind of stuff, did a couple of Facebook Lives just to remind people that, hey, this is going on tonight. Maybe you saw it in your feed or the newsletter and you didn't put it on your schedule, but now you know you have time. Boom. And I, I know I picked up seven or eight people uh, at the last minute who just happened to see it. I showed them the setup, kind of did a walkthrough, gave them a little inside look at where the venue was. And that was fun. That's something I hadn't done before that point. And I learned you're not supposed to turn your phone sideways when you do that. So, hey, <laughs> you learn something all the time, even when you're an old dude like me. So, uh, yeah, you've got your promotion of the show. That's your third thing that you need to do. And then you record. So the recording, you know, there's a lot of different ways you can record a show. I'm not going to walk you through all the technical steps. Probably do that on another episode if you want to know about equipment. But you take that recording and mix it down. If you're doing it by yourself, this could take a while. If you're using a record label, it definitely sped things up for me. I felt like there was a little bit of, not bad pressure, but good pressure. Like, hey, this is due. Let's get get on this. And that moved it up the priority list for me on my daily activities until I got it knocked out. And uh, then you've got the mix. You get down to what you think is your final mix. I advise letting it sit because, A, while you're mixing it down, you're listening to your material a lot. You might get tired of things. You might think things are not as funny as they were when you first recorded it. Get your mix. Walk away from it for a couple of weeks if you have that kind of time, at least a week if you don't. And then come back to it fresh, listen to it, and see if it still makes sense all the way through the way you've got it uh, mixed down and edited. And then the real work starts. You've got your project in the can, but, man, the next step once you've got your tracks isolated, you know what you're going to name your tracks, you need to get this in the system so you pick up your royalties. So even before you submit it to any distribution center, a download place, you want to make sure you register your tracks with Sound Exchange. I have a podcast with the folks from Sound Exchange. I can link to that in the show notes if you're interested in how you go about doing that. But Sound Exchange is a government appointed agency that collects royalties, both musical and and for comedians, anything that's distributed over the internet, uh, Sound Exchange has codes that you plug in. Uh, you have ISRC codes that you determine with your record label. That uh, basically, anytime your track is played, those codes show up digitally, and the internet uh, lets people know where this is coming from. And so, whoever you have tracking your royalties, like Sound Exchange uh, or TuneCore, or whoever you go with can determine, okay, Rick's getting played in Canada right now at 2 a.m. They collect that information, and they collect the royalties from whoever was playing my stuff, so I get paid for that. So there is some almost accounting, almost, I guess, creative accounting work where you're, uh, uh, what would be the right word? You're giving 
numbers and codes to your tracks so you can track them. If you've never done that before, that does sound pretty intimidating, right? That's where a record label can help you. You know, I did it before with my other nine CDs, but it is a process that you need to get taken care of because there's, I guess there's, you can release something and not get paid for it and you're happy with that. But if you're going to release it, you want to get paid for your work. So going through sound exchange, making sure you have your ISRC codes plugged in there, then sound exchange will actually attribute a sound exchange code to that too. So the platforms they track, uh, they make sure it's like double chance that you're going to get the information to sound exchange when there's the ISRC and the sound exchange code. That's a little technical, I'm sure, but there is a sound exchange episode, like I said, you can listen to if you want more information on that. If you have music, I do. You may, you may not. Uh, you want to make sure that your songs are registered with BMI, ASCAP, and I believe some people use TuneCore for that as well. I am an ASCAP member, so I make sure that I forward all the information of this CD that is musical onto them. Now, those songs that I have on my CD... I also have a publisher for those songs, and I make sure the publisher is fully aware that I'm putting the CD together and that they you know, put in the right amount of paperwork to make sure that I get the publishing royalties from those songs. You may not have music. Skip that step if you don't have it, but as a musician, you probably already know about ASCAP, BMI, and so, so on. So make sure that you're getting your tracks tracked by everybody possible. All right, once you've got that done... You have a choice. You can release your project strictly digitally, just for download, have no physical CD, or you have both. The record label I went with, uh, we established that they would have the digital responsibility, and if I wanted to sell physical project, that was on me. So they gave me the full master, and actually the record label went ahead and did the artwork for me, which uh, was super nice. I love the way this thing turned out. And they gave me those templates and those uh, final PDFs to forward on to the the uh, physical replication company. I used CD Baby. I'm sorry. I used Disc Makers. And CD Baby, if you don't have a record label, will help you distribute your stuff. So anyway, I used Disc Makers, sent them the stuff. I have all the rights to the physical CD. I can sell them after my shows. 100% that goes back to me. I don't have to worry about uh, splitting royalties with the record label on that. Record label, I'm splitting royalties for the digital play, for everything that goes on Sirius XM, uh, other things that they distribute it to, they get their share, I get my share. And I'm happy with that, again, because they have relationships that I don't have with people at Sirius XM, people at Pandora, people at Spotify. They can get those meetings, promote my CD, promote that project to them directly, and I'm the beneficiary of that. They get rewarded for their half of the work, I get rewarded for mine. So, again, that's another big step. Digital versus physical uh, product. You decide what you want to do with that. And how much product, how you go about that, you know, there's, uh, there is. There is an episode with disc makers. I'll put that in the, in the show notes. So you can go back and listen to Jeremy talk about the different ways you can get your material uh, produced physically by disc makers, the different plans and projects and prices they have. I was basically able to get 500 discs for about $535. So just barely more than a dollar a disc. I can sell them for 10 or 15 after my shows, make a nice little extra coin there without too much of an upfront cost. I mean, the beauty of going with a record label, they paid for the recording. They own the master, but now I have the recording uh, files to go make the physical project, with, which I own. And that saved me a bunch of money in the short run. Now, in the long run, the record label will do fine by getting royalties for ever and ever. And uh, that was a trade-off I had with this one. But I'm happy again with the plays I'm getting and the uh, the response so far from the CD. All right. Uh, tell you what, let's play another track from the CD, and I'll come back with the final two steps of your CD project. I enjoy going back up to Kentucky. I usually bump into somebody from high school, which uh, can go either way, right? Yeah, I bumped into this girl at the gas station. I hadn't seen her in 20 plus years. And she's all weird. She's like, Rick, is that you? Oh, buddy, you look a whole lot different now than you did in high school. You look better. I'm like, well, gosh, how bad did I look back in high school? <laughs> then she goes, have you had some work done? I mean, serious. What part of me looks like it's been tweaked a little bit? Because <laughs> I'd like a refund. <laughs> but I'm never going to see her again, probably. I just went along with her. I'm like, oh, yeah, you busted me. <laughs> About six years ago, I went in for the Steve Buscemi eye transplant. 
After that settled down, I got the Nicolas Cage forehead expansion. And, uh, I'm hoping to get a little bonus money and get the Betty White ankle tuck. Let's go. I mean, I'm never going to see her again, so I was right back at her. I'm like, well, you look different, too. I remember you as a sweet, quiet, pretty girl. <laughs> well, now you got a face for podcasting and a voice for ham radio. Let's go. <laughs> All right, final two steps of the CD process, your pre-sale and your on-sale. And to be honest with you, my previous nine CDs had no pre-sale. I would record them, get the physical product, then I would start selling them. The fun thing I thought this time around with the record label was the pre-sale. We have a two-week pre-sale where they promote it on the social networks. Uh, and interesting, I give them my passwords and login information for YouTube, for Facebook, for Twitter, and I can't Instagram, I guess I have. And then they create some visuals. They create some short videos. They help promote it. They share that with their entire network of people who have bought CDs from them uh, and downloaded stuff from them. So it's they're giving me an audience I don't have to promote to. And then also gave them my email list so that they could put those emails into a Facebook ad group. Uh, if you listen to this show and you're on any of my email lists, you probably saw an ad for my CD at some point. Uh, they were responsible for putting that together. And, you know, I wrote the copy, they would put out the ads to go with it. And that saved me, again, a lot of time because they can put that in. They know what they're doing. They are, they have a social media person who that's all she does. And she's great at it. So had I been independent trying to do a pre-sale by myself, I would have had to hire somebody to do that. This was part of the deal. And that's part of why you trade off some of the income that you make from your CDs. You're getting all this extra expert help, which I'm more than happy to do this time around. The pre-sale lasts two weeks. Through that time, they're picking up pre-orders that uh, people can download through Amazon, a lot of different channels. And then you have the on-sale, which takes place, if you're listening to this, it's, it's probably on right now, to be honest with you. And that's the day of release, March 16th, 2018, for this CD, Thinking Real Loud. The CD is live for download, live for sale. People that pre-ordered will automatically get it. And it's uh, it's a big day of celebration. A lot of fun. And uh, luckily, it worked out to where this podcast came out the day before. And I thought, kind of at the last minute, I should have thought this about a month ago or even uh, six months ago when I started to think about the CD is how I can incorporate you know, promoting the CD through the podcast, since you guys uh, are my listeners, and hopefully some of you guys like what I do comedy-wise, that maybe you want to order this. And, of course, I'll have all the links to downloads and to where you can buy the CD, or if you want to buy it directly from me or from my website and get the physical CD. All that will be in the show notes as well, and you can kind of see what those look like and how those things work. But that's the final step. And then there's promote, 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 promote from here on out. I want to make sure I move my CDs. I want to make sure I pick up some new fans. I want to make sure I interact with those fans, all those different things, and have this new CD be a nice experience for not only me, but the record label. The record label is doing their part by getting it aired on Sirius XM. In fact, I just checked my stats, and uh, they got the CD to them like a week ago, and they were able to get me on some channels that I've never been on before on Sirius XM. Raw Dog is typically the unedited, uncensored channel. And because all my stuff is clean, I never got it in the hands of the people that run that channel. Well, they got it in front of those folks. And right now, they're playing my tracks two to one over the Clean Comedy channel. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, even though my tracks are clean, they're on the, the unclean or unedited channel, which uh, is a nice bonus, something I would not have been able to do by myself. All right, hopefully that wasn't too technical, too boring, or too monotone. As I'm <laughs> telling you all this stuff, I sometimes forget this is a comedy podcast. But it's a step. It's a it's a nice thing to have a CD. Uh, you know, people are buying less physical products, so having the digital aspect to download is, is huge. There are opportunities for you to buy digital download cards and have people uh, pay for it and then... You give them a card after the show where they go into a specific website and download it. That's great. However you want to get the uh, word out about your CD, go ahead and do it. Lots of different things these days that we didn't have back in the first days. Where I recorded my first CD actually to reel to reel. Oh my goodness. 1993 or 4, something like that. Recorded things on reel to reel. Then a mini disc. Then DAT. And then a digital box that looked like a uh, almost looked like a huge keyboard is a Korg D8 
and then moved on to hiring other people this last time to bring in their equipment. Lots of fun. I'm going to play one more track from the CD here in a second. Thanks again. And if you don't mind, if you want to pick up the CD, uh, I'd be ecstatic to, to sell a few of these on the day of release or even shortly thereafter. And uh, let me know what you think about the CD. If you do pick it up, let me know that you got it so I can thank you for doing that. And uh, again, I'll play a track here in a second. Did want to mention a couple of things going on that you might still have time to check out. Grand Rapids Laugh Fest, the weekend that this podcast comes out, I will be doing a show on March 17th, St. Patrick's Day show, 2 p.m. at Fountain Street Church in Grand Rapids. You can get tickets by going to laughfestgr.org or just type in Laugh Fest into your search bar and you'll see how to get tickets on there. Uh, Two o'clock show, $22 a ticket. You might be like, what? That's a lot. It's a huge fundraiser for Gilda's Club. So the money, a majority of it, is going to Gilda's Club and we're helping out with that cause. So you want to check that out. That is on March 17th. Uh, Other upcoming live shows, I will have one in the uh, area that lies between Cincinnati and Dayton in Bright, Indiana on April 8th. I'll put some information about that in the show notes. That's an open to the public show. And then lastly, a couple of classes going on here from the School of Laughs. The Business of Comedy class, April 15th, 1 to 4 p.m. If you live in the area and you're trying to do comedy full-time, I'll tell you what, it's it's an intense three to four hours. Uh, it'll probably end up being one to five because I sit there and take questions for another hour after the class is over. It'll really give you a roadmap of what it takes to put together a comedy career and every step of the way, what you need, what you don't need, what to spend time on, what not to spend on time, your time on. We talk about merchandise, we talk about niches, comedy clubs, corporate, churches, cruise ships, colleges. We talk about how to market yourself, how to use social, different uh, tools and techniques to use on social to get your word out there. Talk about booking with booking agencies, booking agents. We talk about managers. We talk about percentages. We talk about what comedians make at each level, what to expect and how long it takes to get there to that level to make that money. Uh, if you're on the fence, you've been listening to the podcast for a while, and you're thinking, man, I don't know if I should take that class or not. Uh, for podcast listeners, I'm going to give you a money-back guarantee. That's April 15th, 1 to 4. Probably go on to 5 if you want to ask a lot of questions. And that'll be in the uh, Hermitage area just outside of Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, it's $99 for the course. You walk out of there with like a 42-page workbook. All the information you need at different points to get your career going. Some information you won't need for a few years. Some information you needed last year. Uh, That's April 15th. And then if it's the writing that's holding you back, April 9, 16, and 23, I'll be running the writing class again. Even if you're performing and you're not performing at the level you think you should, you're probably not using all the techniques and strategies that comedians use to get the big laughs. Uh, I wouldn't, I would say this is a great class, obviously, if you're starting from scratch, but if you've been at it for a while and you just can't get over the hump with your material, uh, treat yourself, come in and take that class. We meet those three Mondays from six to 8 PM. And the uh, cost of that class is 200 bucks. That also comes with a pretty hefty workbook. So you keep on working after the class and anytime I teach that class here again in Nashville, you can come in and sit on it, sit, (laughs) sit on that class, sit in on that class for no extra charge. You pay for it once, you have lifetime access, and you'll see if you come to class, we have people that come back every single time to pick up some stuff, some tips now that they're further along. You might take the class as a very beginner. Three years down the road, you're like, you know what? I'm forgetting some things. I need to go sit in on that. You'll see people like that coming in, pick up some new tips and, you know, kind of tweaking their act and tightening things up and uh, recreating great habits and eliminating some bad ones they may have picked up over time. All right, that's it for me. Again, thanks for listening. Uh, Thanks to Bruce Bradford Royal for sponsoring the podcast through Patreon. Thanks to the Clean Comedy Challenge. Check that out, cleancomedychallenge.com, for a a variety, three different places you can get involved with the Clean Comedy Challenge. And I've had students and podcast listeners that have attended that, and they all rave about it. So it's got my endorsement, and I think you'll have a good time doing that. Thanks again. One last track to listen to from the CD, and I'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Have a good one. Stay safe and stay funny. I know we've got parents in here, and if you're not a parent, you were a kid once, and Disney is like the dream vacation for everybody, right? And my little girl got to that age recently. She goes, can we go to Disney? And I'm like, oh, man. Have you priced out Disney? It's ridiculous, isn't it? My wife's like, we can just have a garage sale and pay for it.
I'm like, yeah, you want to sell your car or mine? <laughs> we couldn't raise enough money to take an Uber to the airport for Disney. <laughs> So we looked at enough stuff online, we found this place, Aquatica. They had this thing in there called Ruse Rapids. I don't know if you know what this is. You've heard of a lazy river, right? A lazy river on 12. That's what this thing was. It was basically a rapids. You had to wear a life jacket, and you just hop in and try not to die. <laughs> That's what the guy said. I said, what do we do? He goes, just try not to drown. Hold on to somebody. <laughs> I'm like, I didn't sign any papers up front. <laughs> So my little boy's like, let's do it. So we hop in there. Within two seconds, we were like 40 miles an hour. And it's just like full steam ahead. He's, he can't even swim. I've got him by one collar. And we, just, <laughs> we go around once. We see where we're supposed to get out. We can't get out because the current brings you back. Up. Here comes another lap. Let's go. Hang on. We go around the third time around. There's a kid in front of us. He's been there the whole time. He's kind of stuck on our feet on his little. He's like, Whoo. he had had too much cone of ice. I don't know if you. Yeah. Whoo. Right there it was. We were chasing a rainbow around and around for like 30 I'm like, we are no more than two scrubbing bubbles in a toilet right now. What the heck? Here's your $47. Thanks for having us. I've learned to distrust Disney. They got some weird stuff, you know. My little girl loves uh, Frozen. Y'all seen that movie Frozen? She's seen it, and I have probably a million times. And she's still young enough, she doesn't get the moral of the story. So I'm here trying to explain it to her one day. I'm like, that princess gets really angry, and she shuts people out and freezes them out of her life, and that's not good. Uh, how can she stop doing that? My little girl goes, I reckon she should just cut off her hands. I'm like, what the, what the, what the heck is this, Disney on ISIS? What's uh, what the, I'm going to check your backpack before I bring you in the house. What the heck? listening to the School of Laughs podcast. If you'd like to hear more School of Laughs podcasts, you can find them on iTunes and Stitcher.com. And don't forget to subscribe and leave a review. For information on upcoming live and online classes, visit SchoolofLaughs.com. Until next time, stay tuned, stay focused, and stay money.